Part two is here. It's a Christmas miracle. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Notes from My Improv Notebook, your internet's resource for free improv knowledge. My name is Chell Hernandez. I'm an improviser here in Los Angeles, California, and it is my pleasure to have you listening to this podcast. If you haven't already, please rate and review this podcast. That really helps me get to more improvisers just like you who want to learn more, and I really appreciate that. Without further ado, here's part two of Paul Valentine. something that uh, this pivots us to and something that you wanted to bring to the podcast was using the wear of the scene. Yeah, for sure. And I think the wear of the scene really increases uh, the depth of what we as an audience see and also helps each other's game. So yeah. greedy guy at the bank is going to be super funny compared to like greedy guy at uh, in heaven, you know, whatever it for may sure. be. But I think sort of that's, that's sort of interesting too, is like a naturally and obviously greedy guy goes to the bank that makes total sense that's like totally in his game mm -hmm. but w if he goes to heaven what is what does greedy guy do in heaven like that's that's interesting him seeing him play his game in heaven is like well what is he going to be greedy about is he going to try to get more clouds is he going to try to get more harps than the next person is he trying to get a better um like a better place like closer to god or whatever like what is he going to be greedy about you know yeah and so that so even putting him in an unlikely situation feeds his game because it challenges him like oh how am i going to play my game in this situation right mm -hmm. sometimes i think people are more more interesting when they're sort of slightly out of their um out of their sort of element yeah out of their element out of their comfort zone greedy guy in a bank yes for sure greedy guy at a pet store okay what's that about yeah show me that you know so i think you that sort of challenges them up a little bit I do feel like, you know, a lot of making steps from beginner to intermediate uh -huh. is filling in that location that using that where like a lot of scenes that I may see at a beginner level might not feature a lot of where like yeah. they're trying to understand the relationship between yeah. them and kind of establish. And that. that's totally it, man. I mean, that's if you sort of put things in order from from the front to the back in front should be the relationship and in back is the is the where or the activity or whatever. But that. And you should really get good at the relationship first. Like that's really the 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 hinge of it, right? That's really the whole point. And but then though having that wear uh, or that activity, like you said, helps you sort of take that scene from two dimensional to three dimensional. Yeah, I think it really fills out the scene in such an amazing way. And when you watch people who are good at that, who really do that, it's like, oh, this is like night and day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. You know, because it goes from like. I sort of always tell my students, like, you want to feel like if the lights went out, you would still be missing something in the scene, mm. you know, as opposed to like, it'd be the exact same scene in the dark as it is uh, with the lights on. Like, that's not, you're wasting these tools. You're wasting these tools, yeah. you know? Uh, when has been a personal experience that you felt that the location using the wear really just uh, amped up your play at that moment? Oh like, my gosh, all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. I do man versus movie and that's like a ton of like acting stuff out and it's just me. So like a lot of times it's just you sort of are showing things through behavior and, and interacting with the wear and yeah. interacting with, you know, maybe other people who like other characters in the scene that I'm playing all the different characters. But by using the wear, I'm sort of keeping the whole thing animated and yes. alive. Yes. Man versus movie is a one man show. Mm -hmm. And I know when we do one man shows, I've experienced this in the past. You really do have to feel like you're filling in all the blanks. So it does feel like, oh, I have to make a bigger gesture of what the, the where is, the location to really establish myself and so that people can believe in the reality that I'm creating. Right. Yeah. Because I'm trying to sort of communicate so much as, as a single person. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the things I really like about Geraldo is that sort of that when you guys play, you're sort of cognizant of like, of that you're playing in a different language. And I feel like the gestures and the, the emotions and everything are just a little bit bigger yes. than when I see you guys play in English, like the, the different members of the team I've seen in different shows and stuff. And I feel like that's one of the things I really love about Geraldo is that it's slightly amped up yes. and it's really interesting. And you can like, I don't speak hardly any Spanish, you know, but I can totally follow the show and I laugh and I'm like, yeah, I don't know what that person's saying, but I get it. And I'm laughing. And it's like, <laughs> it's one of my favorite parts of the show. One of the things I really love about, especially when people see it for the first time when they're like, I don't know, I don't really know Spanish. How am I going to, and then they're like, oh my God, that was awesome. Hilarious. Right. And you get to see those different things. That's when we get to go from telling 
to showing. Yes. You know, because show always beats tell. And you can't show unless you're using some sort of physical medium. That is your body or the wear of the scene. And theater is such a physical medium. Like, it needs to be big. It's theater, right? We go to watch people be theater to be bigger than life than what we're used to sure. in our real lives. And with Geraldo, going back to that point of, like, getting stuck in your head and being like you know, am I making the right move? Because I'm doing it in another language, it doesn't feel like I have that barrier at times. Mm -hmm. It feels like this is just what I have to do. And, this and is do what you think that's do. because you have another challenge that you're working with, like doing it in in Spanish? Or do you feel like that's just you're more comfortable in that way? Why do you think that is the difference? To me, it's a yeah. challenge. It's right. not comfortable. I yeah. don't like speaking Spanish because I think I sound super wedo, which is white. Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, but so to me, like to, for me to speak Spanish, it, it takes a lot for me to to feel comfortable in that. And in that Geraldo show, it's just like, I don't have enough time to think this, just, this is what I said. This is what I'm going One with. million percent. That's how I feel about man versus movie too, is it goes super, super fast. Yes. And it's just me. And I don't, I have like, at the beginning, I have 17 seconds as the Fox theme plays to think of what's my first move. And then after that, man, it's all off the chain and just like a spotty in the moment. And, and I come up with stuff that I'm surprising myself or I'm like, oh my gosh, oh, whoa, whoa. And I say that thing and I'm like, oh, where did that come from? And I don't know. And that's what's really thrilling and exciting about doing the show. Yeah. And I think sort of that translates to the audience too. I think they sort of feel that sort of in the moment excitement that they're all discovering it together. You yeah. Know? And how cool that, uh, especially in a one man show is that you're just tapping into your subconscious and you're just like stream of thought. And this is what I think is the best totally. tech, but like your mind in the back is like making all these connections so that you can right. ultimately and, and pull I lean on my habits of doing, I'd done the movie for years and years before I started doing man versus movie. I'd done a scripted one man show that was like an action movie. I'd done that. So I had all the piece and I did a two man show with Pete Gardner for a few years. And so I had a lot of the, I had all the pieces kind of in place. It was just sort of like pulling them all together to make this particular thing. But to your, I have to say this before, to your point about speaking Spanish, you have this sort of like this other challenge. And you're sort of thinking about that or working on that. That's very much like a very popular sort of saying in, in improv is like, it's like Zen archery. You have to distract yourself from the target to hit the target. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about that so that you are able to do that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this conversation has been wonderful. <laughs> Let's go back to using the wear. Yes. Because I just want to make sure that uh, you've given us so many exercises, and I really do thank you for it. Sure. Using the wear, very important. Well, yeah, I, I listened to your episode called Magical Elevens. Uh-huh. And that, and that really sort of, I think, is really related to this. So if people reference back, this is like another fold on that idea. Okay. Because you're the, in that, you're saying, saying the Magical Elevens, people basically just standing stock still and yep. you sort of saying funny things at each other or whatever. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is that this sort of helps people take that out. And I think, let me just say really quickly, the virtues of using the wear are many. And, you know, it, it allows you to show versus tell. Mm -hmm. It allows you to play subtext. It allows you to change up the tempo of this scene. Mm, how, how could you do that? That's, that's Great. interesting. So a lot of times when we're doing a scene, we feel like we have to fill the space with talking. Yeah. Right? Or we feel like the scene's empty. Like, oh, if we're not talking, then we're dying. Mm -hmm. Right? But if you... If part of the scene is also a physical part of the scene, then I can say something to you and I can go back to my activity and I can still fill it with my emotions still exist because I'm doing that. I was using the app like I'm cooking eggs in the morning. I'm cooking them angrily. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you come in and you're like, hey, what, how's it going? I'm like, oh, fine. Just great. Just great. You know, then that tension's in the air and I can go back to angrily cooking my eggs and I don't have to keep talking about whatever you know i can just sort of show that i'm so angry and plus i can show that i'm angry but say that i'm not i'm not mad what are you talking about and it's scraping eggs on your plate <laughs> furiously you know i can play subtext where yeah. i say something but i mean something else or i'm showing something else and yeah. that's really that adds another depth yeah adding emotion to your space work based upon the location that's amazing okay yeah i want to give you the chance to offer what you think is a great exercise for students to just be like how do i get started in using my wear uh, once I have Great. established it. I'll, can I offer three simple ones? Yes. Great. One is a, I'll just sort of do it in order. One is a warm up, and that is five things. Super easy. Tons of people have done it. Basically, you sort of point at someone, you say, Jim, five things you find in a pirate's foot locker. And then Jim says, like, a, a hook. And everyone says, one, a parrot, two, um, gold, three, uh, a, a, a spare hat. Four. four an anchor five. five these are five things and then and then jim points at someone else what i love about this exercise is it's super fun super simple and it's high energy but it also gets your mind turning on the idea of like what's in a pirate's foot locker so when you're in a scene and you're a pirate and you open that chest what's in there 
You know, it's it's something. What is it? And maybe that's something that can move the scene forward. It sort of just sort of primes the pump thinking about the where. And I'll quote Noah Gregoropoulos on this. He's a, a great improviser and one of my teachers in Chicago. And and he's one of the people I would sort of really watch and admire his work. And and me and the, uh, the other guys I worked with one day would just say, well, how do you how do you come up with this stuff in, in the where or whatever? And he said, it is less scary to me to look into the where and see something than to see nothing. Mm. I was like, oh shit, that's really good. Yeah. You know? And so so that's it. That's a, a, a warm up. Five things I think is a really great warm up to get people thinking about the where. Then there's a drill that I do. It's uh, you are, uh, and this is sort of based on exercise from Wendy Molino, a friend of mine who taught at IO for a little bit and performed for a long time. Um, it's uh, it, it's where we sort of just line up in two lines and you have a partner who faces across from you. And we, I do three rounds of it. The first round is professions. I say, you are a police officer. And then my partner would say, yes, that's why I have these handcuffs or whatever. Mm. And then they would say to me, you are a teacher. And I say, yes, that's why I have this apple. And I usually show kind of what I have. All right. So we just do, everyone does ding, 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 does all down the line, like, like pairs at a time, sort of saying, saying that. So, so now when you get into a scene, you sort of have what, what we sort of, let me backtrack a tiny bit. When we as improv teachers or coaches say, use the wear, we usually think of the wear being out there at arm's distance, mm-hmm. right? The furniture or what have you. Sure. But really, for really, the, the wear starts at the surface of your skin. It's like whatever you're wearing, what do you have in your pocket? If you have a badge or a radio or a hat or glasses or whatever, that's all part of the wear, man. And sometimes that's the stuff that helps you the most. It's like what are the personal effects or the hand props, if you will, that your character has? So the first round is professions, super simple. The second round then, sort of going back to the idea of the triangle of the scene, is giving a big playable gift. Mm -hmm. You are sad. Yes, that's why I have this box of tissues. Right. Right. And then my partner says to me, you have a problem with authority. Yes. That's why I have this protest sign. Right. So now you're taking this idea, this sort of ephemeral idea of this emotion or this drive and you're physicalizing it. Yeah. And there, boom. Now suddenly it's a thing. It's a tangible thing in the scene. And I have a way to express that I have a problem with authority. I have a way to express that I'm sad. Yeah. Right. An artifact or a talisman this shows this is it. Yeah, that's such a smart way to to look at it and I never thought of it because in even in real life when you go when you go skiing you're going to wear different uh things sure. than if you go to a football game. Absolutely. And and personalizing those things is, is such a helpful way to really live in that environment that we've created together in this improv scene. For sure. And that and what you have with you and what your character is determines how you solve problems, determines how you sort of interact with the world. Then the third round of the scene uh, of the of the drill is I try to sort of combine both and I say you are a an accountant that wants to be treated like a princess. Yes, that's why I have this bedazzled calculator or whatever, right? <laughs> or you are a doctor that dreams of travel. Yes, that's why I have this stethoscope with a picture of Hawaii on it. <laughs> you know, whatever that thing might be. So it's like combining ideas, yeah. right? But ultimately, as I try to stress to my students that it, it's more important to say something than the right thing. Like, mm-hmm. don't labor over it. If I say you're a ballerina, then if you say, "Uh, yeah, that's why I have this," um, 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 um I'd rather you just say, "I'm a, yeah, yeah, that's why I have this um hammer." Yeah. Okay, great. Now we live in a world where ballerinas carry hammers. I'm interested in that. Let's see where that goes. Right? Yeah. Don't try to be wacky. Don't try to be crazy. But just say. Just say something like get get in the habit of of being of taking risks. Mm-hmm. You know, you always take a risk. So, I mean, that's that's it. So that's that's the drill. So the warm up and the drill and then the exercise, the scenic exercise that I really love. My absolute number one top favorite exercise for using the wear is touch to talk. Touch to talk. Where basically I'll give this the uh, the players a wear a suggestion of a location to be in. Like um, you're in a teacher's lounge. Right. And then they're going to do a scene, but they have to touch something new in the wear each time before they talk. Mm. So this is like pushing. This is the turning the, the wear dial all the way to 100. 100 percent of the time they're going to be using the wear. And that's pushing them, pushing them, pushing. them. And then maybe after the scene, maybe in their work, they still use it 20, 25 percent of the time. Yeah, they're still in the top 1% of space work, right? Yes, exactly. So it just pushes them because once you, if you know you have to touch something each time before you talk, you have to really take in the wear. You have to really sort of like fill that thing out, mm-hmm. you know? And one thing I sort of try to, one sort of hint that I give them is, is that if you know why you're there, why are you in the teacher's lounge? I'm here to grade papers. Great. That gives you a big sense of kind of like, a lot of the different things in the process of yeah. doing this. It narrows down your location to what you can have in that space. Yeah. 
yeah, or I'm here to have lunch Mm -hmm. or whatever, right? And and people might be there for different reasons. But if you have sort of a a big arc of why you're there or sort of kind of what is it you're involved in, then then you're not sort of leaping like stone to stone, like, oh, there's a coffee cup. Oh, there's a donut. Yeah. Right, but if you're like, I'm I'm here to have lunch. Okay, I'll go to the refrigerator. I will pull out my lunch. It's in a paper bag. I'll pull it out and sort of unwrap it. And I have like a salt shaker to salt it. Maybe I, oh, I go to the soda machine. I get a soda, whatever. I know all the steps of having lunch. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And so I sort of am existing in the space. I'm not sort of in this way. The the exercise works for you. You don't work for the exercise. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of really what we what we want to do. It does feel like from a player perspective that we're constantly juggling. You know, because yeah. I think oh, it feels percent. like you have this idea of where and I got to juggle that and I got to juggle our relationship and I got what did you just say I got to add that ball to the thing sure how, how do you maintain that 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 complete awareness so that you don't let those balls fall great <laughs> so I think that sort of uh, having done some juggling in college I, I think that sort of the, the trick is that you're really only holding on to one ball at a time, mm. right? So you're sort of cycling through those different things and when I my example I always use is the triangle of the scene when I am using the triangle of the scene, there's always three things that I can do. I can talk about myself and my game. I can talk about you and your game, or I can work the activity, right? And that's it, man. That's that's really just sort of flipping the flipping the question a little bit. It's not like, what do I have to do, but what do I have to do? Mm. I have these three things, these three tools that I can use. Like if you and I are really talking, that's really happening, then maybe that's really what we're, what, what, what we're working on. But if there's like a little moment of silence, then maybe I'll go to the activity for a second. How smart. I you think know? I, the, the thing that really solidified it for me was you're only touching one ball at a time. Yeah. So to me, I think as a player, I'm thinking of everything that's in the air at that time Mm -hmm. rather than really being an intentional and just looking at what's in my hand at the current time, whether it's that conversation or whether it's us just walking around the space and enjoying it. Right. For sure. What's in my moment to moment. It's always it's usually one of those three things. I'm either working the activity or I say something about you or I say something about me. Mm -hmm. Those are really the three things that happen the most in the scenes. And it's usually one after another. And if I'm really being simple about it, then what I say influences you to say or do what you're going to do next. And what you say or do next influences me to do what I'm going to say or do next. And Mm -hmm. that's that sort of paint that real ping pong of it, you know, and a lot, also a lot of times we can just sort of keep the we can keep the the activity going at a really low stage. If I'm making eggs, I can make eggs for an entire scene. They'll never get done. They'll never get eaten. It doesn't really matter, but it just keeps me alive in the scene, and I can just you know whatever. And I have a second to you know just sort of change up the tempo a little bit. I don't have to go so fast. I always use this quote from Benjamin Franklin, who says, "A pipe gives a wise man time to think, and an idiot something to stick in their mouth." <laughs> and the thing is, the audience doesn't know which one you are at yeah, that moment. Exactly. Sometimes you're like cooking eggs, you're like, I totally got this. And sometimes you're just cooking eggs and you're thinking, oh shit, 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 <laughs> right? But you have a little time. You've bought yourself a little time because you're not just filling the scene with talking. Yes. So you have some time to take a breath, listen to what your partner said, take them in for a second, consider, and then say your then say your move. You can be a little more strategic about it. It does feel like in those oh shit, oh shit moments that when the audience is just constantly watching and they're as interested as you, but not in the oh shit aspect, but like what's gonna come next. Like sure. they're really giddy about it. Sure. And when you do like find a way to incorporate that oh shit moment, it feels like everyone, it's like an explosion of energy. Like everyone's like, wow, that was awesome. That right. was great. Right, for sure. So I, wow. The audience is there and it's like, there's a lot of drama going on. Like there's the, the drama on stage or whatever, but then there's like this meta drama of like the players because they know that you're making it up, mm-hmm. but they're rooting for you to succeed. Yeah. It's like when you say, okay, we have a suggestion and the audience is like Zamboni, like, oh shit. You're like, oh shit. But they're like, oh, come on, can they do it? I want them to do it. I want to see something cool about Zamboni. They're rooting for you. They're challenging you, but they're rooting for you to, to rise to that challenge yeah and what a great environment to be a part of to yeah. be rooted on while you get a challenge absolutely and they're totally rooting for you to, to, to rise to that challenge yeah. let me just say two other things about the wear really quickly one is the scene is never about the wear mm-hmm. it's the wear is always there to serve you you're not there to serve the wear and then i would be remiss if i didn't say my favorite saying about the wear and that is sometimes we if we're not talking about our relationship we'll start talking about the activity right and that gets us off track that's one of the tricks of using the using the wear is not talking about it or not making it the centerpiece of the scene mm-hmm. right and mark sutton has a great saying about this which is no one ever left an improv show saying man they really fixed that bike because <laughs> it's not about that it's just it's just what we're doing while we're relating the centerpiece is always you in terms of like ordering things the relationship's always in the front and the activities 
in the back. Yeah. And as I progress, I think where I'm now, I, I really use the environment personally as like a metaphor for what's going on sure. between our relationship. Absolutely. So the angry eggs would be like a great example. Of for that. sure. And, and, and when you th- sort of think about making it all personal, right, which is one thing we do in improv, we sort of make it personal. We sort of take a big idea and make it personal or whatever. The, the example I always think of that I use with my students is if you and I are on vacation in Hawaii and that volcano erupts, that's something about us, mm-hmm. right? And I make it something about us. Oh, great. Thanks a lot, Don. You always get me into these situations. Just another Don situation. <laughs> volcano erupting on vacation. Great, <laughs> right? But now I've taken this thing of this volcano thing and make it something between the two of us. And that's really where I think the magic happens is between the two of us. Because your partner's the only other real thing on stage besides a couple of chairs. And so you, know, you the more you invest in them, the more you sort of reap a return on that investment. Yeah. Well, Paul, uh, you've dropped so much improv knowledge <laughs> on my podcast. I'm so inspired to go play. Like, I wish I could go play right now. Me too. Yeah, it's just so much fun talking about this. My pleasure, absolutely. Thank you for having me. But thank you so much for for giving so much information. Uh, you are right now the head of the Revolution Theater. I am. Which is over at the Raven Playhouse in North Hollywood. Yes. And so if anyone has a chance and you're in, in Hollywood, please go to those shows. They're on Friday and Saturdays. No, just Friday. Just Friday. We are on hiatus till the new year. Okay. But I would love if people have the chance to go to our Facebook page, Revolution Theater on Facebook, or our Instagram, Revolution Theater on, on Instagram or check out my um, I have a ton of free improv tips on my YouTube channel which is P as in Paul V as in Valancourt PV Improv um, on, on YouTube or you can check me out at What's Up with PV on Instagram well thank you so much Paul and uh, thank I you, hope man. to have you back in the future I would love to come back anytime As you just listened to one of my favorite talks about improv I've ever been a part of. I was so excited to have Paul here, and I was so excited that you guys got to share that experience as well. Please follow him on Instagram. If you're interested in taking a class with Paul, please head to the Revolution Theater. He is a great teacher. If you are too far away for classes and you're like, hey, I wish he wrote a book, he did. Please search on Amazon, Triangle of the Scene, and you can find a digital or physical copy of the book. Again, if you haven't already, please rate and review this podcast. I would really appreciate it. You can always reach out to me for questions. My email is highsilentx at gmail.com. And if you would like to follow me on Instagram, that'd be great. I'm highsilentx on Instagram. Thank you so much, and I hope you guys have a great rest of the December. More interviews with Pauls, please.